And now, without any further ado, our one and only guest speaker from Streams Ministries, Charity Quebec. And if it offends you that there's a woman preaching, there's inner healing and deliverance during the week for that. Right? Or? Or the door. Woo! That, hey, you think I'm unfiltered. If y'all just extend your hands towards her real quick before we both get in trouble. So, Father, I just, <laughs> I just bless her right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for her and our friendship. And I thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you've placed in her. And I just say you have full freedom to speak everything the Lord's put on your heart. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm a little wrecked this morning. I, um, I'm wrecked in the Holy Spirit. So I got a good night of sleep last night. But every time I come to Cross Kingdom, I am overwhelmed by the love of God for this house. I am overwhelmed by the mercies of God. And this weekend, it was spoken over me that I have a mom's heart. And I remember, so several months ago, I'm, I'm a little sassy. I know it's, you'll see, it's okay. Again, there's inner healing and deliverance for these things. But I'm a little sassy. And so um, a couple years ago, we have this head intercessor. And everyone would say, oh, my gosh, you've got to meet Sherry. She's so sweet. You just can't believe how sweet Sherry is. And one day... I was like, hey, how come no one ever says I'm sweet? That's weird. <laughs> I know. So I started really praying and asking the Lord, I want to be sweet. And he gave me a spanking. He gave me a spanking in the spirit. And he said, that's not what I created you for. I created you to war and I created you to battle. And so from that moment forward, I thought, man, I really want to authentically be who I am in Christ. But one piece of sweetness I always associate with motherhood. So the one part that I feel like he has really given me is such a heart for his people. So I really can't go on until I give a couple of words that I got during worship, okay? So right here, one, two, three, fourth row, you with the short red hair, girl in the stars. I am overwhelmed with the Father's love for you. I want you to know that the way that he feels about you, he has so much tenderness for you. And there have been moments where things have been spoken over you. Well, I want to speak the truth over you. You are smart. You are kind. You are lovely. You are beautiful. And you are accepted. And the Father is passionate for your heart. The way that he feels about you overwhelmed me so much that I, I had to sit. And so I want you to feel from me to him. I mean, from him through me to you, his love. And I would like permission. I feel like he told me that he is father and he is mother. And that you needed a mother's hug. May I have permission to do that? I got to take my shoes off. It's hot. It's hot in here now. They even have holes. They're airy, but it's warm. It's warm. All right, you in the red sweatshirt, second row right here. I'm just overwhelmed today. I'm going to cry all the time, okay? The Lord is saying to you, you are forgiven. You are accepted. Would you look at me? I want you, when you see my eyes, to see the way that he sees you. He is saying there is nothing. There is nothing that stands between us. You don't have to perform. 
You don't have to live up to anything, whatever burden someone has put on you that told you you had to be a certain thing to enter into his presence. It's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. He loves you, and he is saying, come and be with me. I want to be with you. So, Father, we just thank you for the way that you love your son. We thank you, God, for the way that you have fully accepted him, that there is no task or thing that he has to do to enter into your presence, but that he is fully loved and accepted right here where he is on the way to where you're taking him, and you are not finished yet. I see a present. I actually see a gift, and I feel like you have these gifts inside you that have been sort of closed up in this box, and they've been reserved, but this is the time for such a time as this for those gifts to be released in the body of Christ. You have leadership on you. You have a call to speak to others. You, you have walked through some things, and the Lord is bringing you on the other side, and you'll be a voice to people where they say, okay, if, it, if he did it for him, he'll do it for me. So we just say yes and amen to his testimony. If you'll do it for him, you'll do it for them. Yes. Two more. Che. Che, where are you? Che, this is a, this is a, girl, we're the same. So you're going to get what I'm saying when I say this. This is a nudge, okay? Not a spanking, but a nudge. It's time for strategy. This is the season for strategy. Every time I looked at you this weekend, I heard strategy, strategy, strategy. This is the season where what has happened has been miraculous for Mercy Gate. But the Lord is saying, I have so much more. You got a partner with someone who can bring this strategy to take it to the next level. There's a season where it has to be as much as we are totally led by the Holy Spirit. This is a season where there's got to be a strategy in place because the growth is coming in such a way you cannot think or imagine. So the word for you for this year, your homework assignment, baby girl, is strategy. Got it? All right. Last one. Lisa. Lisa, the Lord has a shift coming for you. I feel it. It's like I can see you turning. It's already begun. There's something that has started. I don't even know if you're aware of it or not, but there is something that has started. It's an opportunity for you. And it's scary. When it comes, it's going to feel like I'm not sure. Capacity is the word that I hear. I'm not sure if I have the capacity for this. And there was a word spoken over me that I'm going to release over you in the rock. The Lord is saying, just release the rock. He's got the capacity. He has it in his hands. And so when this comes and it feels overwhelming, lay that down. Lay that down at his feet. You can't do it. You're actually not able to do it in your own strength. But he's made a way in your capacity and in your ability that you, you're not even aware. So it's coming. And the word is yes. Okay? All right. All right. I said last one, but I'm a liar. <laughs> All right, so we sang this song where we were like, we're going to lay our burdens down, right? We're going to lay them down. We want only what you want. And so I just want us to go into that posture right now. Let's just be before him. Let's don't sing a song, but Lord, Lord, we lay our burdens down. Lord, we lay shame at the foot of the cross where it goes to die, We lay burden at the foot of the cross where you redeem, Lord. We lay rejection before you, Lord. And we say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, move in such a way that we feel the Father's heart for us, that we understand that instead of shame, Lord, there is love. Instead of burden, there is gift. Instead of rejection, there is you are welcome in this kingdom. But what has he done for you? Body of Christ, what do you need to lay down at the foot of the cross and open your hands to? What exchange does he have for you? Do you remember who he is? Do you remember what he has done for you? These revivals are breaking out. I love the word, but it's not because of the word of God being preached. It's because they are encountering the living God. 
They are encountering the living God in such a way that it's transforming their lives. How did you encounter the living God? Remember, body of Christ. Remember him. He is passionate for you. Lay those burdens down and pick up what he has for you. You are loved. You are mighty. You have a plan and a purpose. Walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. (sighs) Okay. I do have a message. (sighs) I wrote two messages. Well, sort of. I had two messages sort of prepared, and I thought, well, the Lord will show me which one it is supposed to be. And so as we went through the weekend, he kept kind of speaking to me. It's going to be about this thing of remembering. Um, But I love the word so much. I get so fired up about the word that that's the one I was, like, trying to do. You know when you, like, love something and you're like, this one would be so easy for me. But when you struggle with something else, you're like, don't make me preach on that, you know, because... That might not be the easiest thing for me. And the Lord, he's funny. He's like, girl, I got you. So, all right. So a while back, I had been camped out in Joshua in my quiet time. And everybody kind of knows the story of Joshua, right? Where he is crossing over the Jordan. He's taking the Israelites over. And the Lord says, I want you to lay down your remembrance. Y'all with me? Y'all know that story? And so as I read that passage, I was like, This is so intriguing to me because I've read it a million times. I've even done a study on Joshua. But when I think about remembering the Lord, like what does it mean to lay down a stone? What does it mean to kind of put your stake in the ground and remembering who he is? And it just kind of started this crazy journey. I love the word. I love how he'll take you all over the place. And so we're going to hit a lot of places today. I kind of was reading through my notes and I was like, oh, Justin, how long do I have? Like two hours? No, I won't go that long. But when we remember the Lord, it's our testimony. I want to ask you, when is the last time you shared your testimony with someone? And I'm not talking about like going and knocking on their door and telling them about Jesus so that you could be a part of their salvation story. But I'm talking about the goodness of God bubbling up and overwhelming you so much that you couldn't help but share your story. When was the last time that happened? For some of us, it was yesterday. Woo, Holy Spirit's here, huh? Some of it, for some of us, it was soon, it was recent. But for a lot of us, if you've been a Christian for more than five years, raise your hand. Okay, that's a big part of this room. Ten years, keep your hand up. Fifteen years, keep your hand up. Twenty years. Man, well, y'all got me beat then, I think. Um, So as we get acclimated, as we just sort of do this walk, we just become used to it. Is that the word I'm looking for? It just becomes like, oh, yeah, that's right. God did that. But anyway, how am I going to get what I need next week? And, you know, the Lord is good all the time. Um, Where's the provision for this? Or whatever we begin to kind of, we can begin to kind of see him in this way of almost transactional. Like, I do my parts, and the Lord does his part, and we live this really good Christian life. And I want to encourage us this morning to remember Because remembering is our testimony. And remembering speaks a better word. And it prophesies. It prophesies to us and it prophesies to others. Because as we remember, we release hope. Do you know who God is? My God did this. My God showed up this way. And he'll do it for you. That speaks to people. That is what starts these crazy on fire college campuses right? I can read scripture to them all day long, and they should be grounded in the word. Do not hear me. Justin and I had a conversation over the weekend, and I was like, you know, 75% of my encounters are through the word. And so here I work for this prophetic ministry, and you know what drives me crazy is when we go from encounter, and we don't do anything here, and then we go to another encounter, and then we don't do anything here, and we're just looking for the excitement. Y'all know what I'm saying? And so when that happens, we just miss out on all the parts of who God is and everything that he has for us. So 
I want you to remember this today because I'm going to say it. I'm going to nail my point over and over and over again, okay? It's the testimony. It prophesies a better word when we remember. So remembering isn't passive. It's an action that brings the power of Jesus into our lives. As we remember what he has done, it it enables us to stop focusing on the impossibility and to focus on the possibility. So, Casey, this is my husband here. Yes, I forgot what Justin said. He said something not nice. This is the middle-aged beautiful man. How's that? Um, I'm just teasing. So, Casey and I have been married 28 years. And, um, yes, thank you. That's hard work, man. For him, not me, because I'm, a, I'm the impossible one, not him. It's been pretty easy for me. Nope. So some of you know our story. We have a son that passed away in a tragic accident after we had been married about five years. And we stepped into our pastor's office, and we were just absolutely broken and wiped out. And our pastor said, hey, you're going to need some help. You guys are probably going to need some marriage counseling. And we were like, oh, gosh, not us. Like, we're good. We, we have a great marriage. This isn't going to affect us at all. And fast forward a couple of years, and it was really hard. It's it's very hard to grieve, and we grieve very differently. And you're broken, and you're trying to go before the Lord for, for the healing that you need, and you're trying to, you're walking out your own personal journey, and then so are they. And it looks very different. And we begin to judge one another. Why aren't you here? Why aren't you doing this? Why doesn't it look this way? And that led to us sitting in the bathroom And uh, he was sitting on the edge of the tub. You know those memories that kind of mark this? They're this, like, line in the sand. He was sitting on the edge of the tub, and he's looking at me, and I'm standing there. And I'm just so angry, and I can't even remember what we were fighting about. And he said, you know, I'm I'm done. Are you done? Like, I love you, but this is hard. I don't want to do it anymore. And I said, me either. I'm definitely done. Like, we fought the good fight. We're going to hang it up. I turn around, I walk out of the bathroom into our master bedroom, and Holy Spirit just descends. And he says, get in there. (laughs) Basically, right now, go back in there and talk this out. Because it wasn't true. It was a lie. And that's what he revealed to me in that moment, was that it was a lie. But it didn't just make it easy, right? It didn't just mean like, oh, okay, well, now that you did that, Holy Spirit, and it's a lie, awesome, now we're perfect. It took this act of remembering who we were, who God had created us to be, and who Casey was. Well, that wasn't easy either. So I started this journal where every day I would write in it the things that I loved about him or the ways that God had made him. And at first, I mean, we tease all the time and say at first there were like two things in there. I love his dimples. And, you know, the, they were like physical features about him because I was just, we were in that place. Anybody ever been in that place? Y'all don't make me feel like I'm alone up here, okay? All right, so we were just in that place where I couldn't get past all the stuff. And so I would write in the journal, and every morning I would commit to write the things that I remembered that were true about him. And so it started out with just a few things, but over time it became a lot of things and page after page. And then I began to put scripture to it. This is who he is, and I began to declare over him the truth of who he was in Christ Jesus, and I began to declare hope in our marriage. Remembering who he was prophesied into our marriage. It just spoke a better word into who we were, so that's just a practical thing from the world. I hid that, put it in the car so he would find it. He did not know I was doing this. He just was like, oh, you're getting nicer. I don't even understand what's happening, you know? And I was like, oh, it's true. It's true. Um, And so I hid it in his car so he would find it. So as we go through this, I want you to think about what it would feel like for you to have a journal written about you and who you are in Christ Jesus and for you to read that. And now I want you to think about what it's like for the Lord. As we talk through this, I want you to think about Father's heart as he hears the things that we say about him and how we remember him. All right, so Bill Johnson summarizes remembrance in his book, Release the Power of Jesus, as remembering as something that someone can learn to do through choice. So remember I said remembering is active. 
It's through choice. And that, in turn, helps to develop spiritual sensitivities. So all of y'all, all of us, looking to encounter Jesus, listen to what Bill Johnson just said. When we remember who the Lord is, it increases our spiritual sensitivities. Why? Because it's about him and not us. Our encounters are not about us. They're about him. And so as we know him and we remember him and we think upon the ways of God and we remember his nature and his character, we hear him. We see him. We find him in those places. Have you ever had something happen and you're like, oh, my gosh, like, this thing was really terrible, but I saw God here, and I saw God here, and I saw God here. How did you see God? Because you knew him, because you were sensitive, because you were looking to hear, to see, right? So it increases our spiritual sensitivities. Remembrance also runs throughout the word. So lest my female preacher stand up here, I'm not a preacher, teacher, stand up here without referencing the word. I'll do that for y'all, okay? So Numbers 10.10, also in the day of your gladness and your appointed feast and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow your trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So when you do this, you will remember who I am. Remembering it reminds us of the goodness of God over and over and over. I'm going to hammer this all morning. You're going to be like, you said that 10 times, but you're going to leave here and you're going to be like, what do I need to remember? Because it's the goodness of God. Dictionary.com defines memorial as something, especially a structure established to remind people of a person or an event. So in the word, as I go through these scriptures, you're going to hear a lot of structures that were built. Remember I said Joshua laid the stones. Um, Jacob built the thing which I'll get to, you know, (laughs) Um, all of those were structures, but there's a reason for that. It got me thinking about the concept of how often it is um, to remember. So I cross-referenced Numbers 10.10. Y'all be writing the scripture down because the Lord is going to, I want you to be able to go back and remember what we talked about today and look it up for yourself. Don't just believe me, right? Don't just take my word. Go look it up for yourself. So Malachi 3.16, this is my favorite. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened to them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Did you hear what I just said? And the Lord listened to them, and a book of remembrance was written for him so that he could capture what you said. So in our house, we do something called the birthday game. Does anybody know what that is? You do, because I think we played it with you, yes? Yes. So, Oh, yes. Okay, good. So the birthday game is one of my favorite things ever. It's your birthday, and we go around the table, and we tell you what's so amazing about you. And it has to be about your character or about your nature or about something like that. It can't be your looks. And it can't be, you know, anything surfacey. It has to be real. So it's gotten to the point now where we do it so much that we pray about it before we go into it because we're like, it's that important to us to speak life over one another. It's that important to us to remember who they are, right? When we remember the Lord, it's like the birthday game. We are playing the birthday game with Jesus, Isn't that an amazing thought to have? It is like the birthday game. How do you think it feels when those things are spoken over you? I mean, there are some people in our family that are like, ah, don't play the birthday game. Write it on a card, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, psh, sorry, nope, nope. And so when it's my turn, I'm like, tell me two, you know, tell me all of the ones. I love words of encouragement. But it's literally like we're playing the birthday game with the Lord, When I cross-referenced Malachi 3.16, I saw Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Unbelief is caused by a hardened heart. Hear that again. Unbelief is caused by a hardened heart, which is caused by the deceitfulness of sin. And the result of that is something called apostasy. It's departing from the living God. It's departing from him. So constant encouragement, constant remembering 
in the midst of fellowship, especially right here with your body of believers, helps you remain faithful. It helps you to walk out in a level of faithfulness that you can't walk out when you're not remembering who he is. The reason I'm hitting this so hard this morning, if you were with us this weekend, raise your hand. Look at that. By the way, dads, thank you for single dadding it while your ladies were here. Thank you. You guys are awesome dads. I wanted us to do this because the ladies were overwhelmed by the love of the Lord this weekend. And some of them had massive shifts and moves. And some were like, you know what, I'm just scratching the surface. But regardless of how big or wherever, wherever they're measuring it to be, the Lord moved and he showed up. And it's important for us to remember that. And so I wanted to end our weekend with them, but encouraging you guys to do the same. So if we take a look more in the pattern of the word, we can see in Genesis 28, 10 through 22, Jacob set a pillar in Bethel to mark the place in which he had a powerful dream where he had a vision of God. I was going to read this, but for the sake of, I'm on like page two of 20, okay? So I'm not going to read that to you, except I'm going to tell you Genesis 28 verses 10 through 22, basically had a dream and he saw the angels ascending and descending. And he was like, this is a holy place. This is a gate to heaven. I've got to mark it. But why is that important? Why am I telling you that? Because early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he'd placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top and he called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household. So these things that God is going to show up and do, he had a holy expectation of. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all of you that give me, I will give you a tenth. But Jacob did not want to forget what God had given him. He didn't want to forget, but it wasn't just for him, because he set up the pillar, and it became a place of worship. So when we remember, we set the stage for those that go behind us. Who goes behind you? I mean, just a really practical one. Your children. Your children. So I'm going to share with y'all a mistake I made in parenting that I wish I could go back and change. And if you are a parent of young children, I want to encourage this in you. We didn't remember the goodness of God enough in our house. We talked about the Lord. We read scripture. We sang songs. We had encounters with the Lord. But when he showed up and he answered prayer, we celebrated in that moment. But we didn't keep a record. We didn't make a memorial of the things that the Lord had done. And he's done big things in my kids' lives. He's healed, physically healed a deaf ear in one of my children. He has delivered one of my children in his bedroom alone. Just showed up. He heard the audible voice of God. And then our last one has been wrecked over and over and his life spared. I mean, I'm talking like almost death, sort of like the accident yesterday where you were like, there's no way we're walking out of this. And he walked out of it. He's done these big things, but we didn't do a good job of remembering those things and writing them down. And so now they're in this world and they're faced with the draw of the world and they've forgotten. They've forgotten who the Lord is. And so people ask me all the time, like, What's your best parenting? What's your da-da? I'm like, I don't know. Don't ask me because this is what I wish I would have done. So I'm doing it now for my grandchildren. So I've started an email account for my grandson because I want to email that account, and I want him when he's older to remember what God has done. I want him to be able to look back and know that his grandmother was recounting every time the Lord showed up in his life and every time the Lord showed up in my life. I want him to be able to read it because that is what will draw him to the foot of the cross, is remembering who God is, knowing and seeing he was living and active, right? So what is our point for today? We use testimony and remembering to prophesy over people. Use it to prophesy over your kids. What? You're confused if God is real? Don't you remember when he healed your ear? Don't you remember when we were driving down the road and we saw this homeless person and the Holy Spirit told us to feed him and to give him water? And then, and then, and then, don't you remember when this happened and God showed up? So these stories are what remind us of who he is. The word, 
gives us the foundation. The stories draw our heart to his. The stories make us go, okay, it's what I said to the girls this weekend. You, no one could ever convince me that God's not real. Why? Because I've experienced him. I've encountered him, and I've remembered for me the goodness of God and what he's done. So what do you need to do to remember what God has done in your life today? What change, what shift needs to happen? In Joshua 4, 1 through 8, God commands the Israelites to cross the Jordan River. It miraculously parted. God is so fun, right? So he is a God of miracles. And Joshua leads the 12 tribes to remove boulders from the riverbed, and they erect them in the promised land in a place called Gilgal. And those 12 stones were a memorial to God's love. This is what I want you to hear. However, these stones were not just for those who witnessed the miracle. Joshua 4, 21 through 22 explains that in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So as we set those, it's not just us speaking it over our kids, but it's our kids saying, what is that? Tell me about that, Mom. So we had a situation where we lived in Memphis for a little while, and their homeless population is out of control. It's unlike, it's probably like what California is to, to describe it. It's insane. And it's dark. It's very dark. If, have any of you been to Memphis or from Memphis? Okay, so there's a spirit, right? Different spirits are over different regions, and over Memphis is a spirit of racism. That it just is what it is. It's just you drive into the city, and you're like, whoa, what has happened? And so when we moved there, people were like, this is a very racist city. And we were like, well, praise God, we're here. We're so naive. We're here to preach the gospel and tell everyone that God has made us all equal and incredibly unique and that he loves us. Hardest city ever of my life. Fighting racism there was just, like, ridiculous. So part of the problem with the homeless homeless population is that the poverty level is so incredibly high, and people are so angry all the time. There's not a ton of help. Does that make sense? And I'm not talking about government help. I'm talking about us being believers in Christ and helping one another. So it is a city ripe, ripe for the picking, for sharing the love of Jesus. So the boys and I... This really burdened us. My kids are sensitive to the things of the Holy Spirit. So we were like, what can we do? So we got some training. We went to a shelter, and the guy was like, don't. You don't want to give money. Not because necessarily everyone thinks that homeless people are drug addicts, and they're really not. That's not always the case. There's a lot of mental health issues. And so if you give them money, what happens is they will be taken advantage of and hurt and harmed for people to take their money. You know, What you want to do is meet a need. You want to love them. You want to listen to their story. Do you know how infrequent it is that we listen to someone's story? That we say, why are you here? And how can I listen to you? And how can I love you and be Jesus? We judge, like, I'm not giving that guy my $5. Y'all, y'all know what I'm saying, right? So we put these care packages together, and we would there would be food and those kinds of things, and we would just talk to people and love them. We're driving one day, we're leaving church, and we're out of the care packages, and there's this guy on the side of the road, and y'all, he is missing this whole front part of his head. It's literally like this, you know? And so I'm a mom, and my kids are in the car, and I'm like, ooh, that kind of freaks me out. Like, I don't know, like, does that make him really angry not to have his, like, frontal piece or whatever? Is this dangerous, you know? And my kids are like, mom you have to pull over. You ha- we have to feed him. And I was like, eh, I don't know about that. You know, we're going to, we're so busy. We're incredibly busy, you know, and we just need to keep going. And they were like, mom, how can you do that? You have to pull over and feed this guy. Like we have to. Fine. So I circle back around. I roll my window down like this much. Excuse me are you hungry? And the sweetest little man on the other side was like, oh my gosh, that would be such a huge blessing. You know, they're not always hungry. So I ask, I don't want to assume and just do that, you know? Um, so I say, okay, I'm going to get him some food. So we drive over, there's a Taco Bell and I go through the drive through and I order this combo meal and it comes with a drink and clear as day, Holy Spirit says, get water. And I'm like, but I'm ordering the combo meal. So I'm paying 22 cents Lord for this Coca-Cola right now. Okay get water. 
<sighs> I'll have water, please. Ma'am, do you know it's only 22 cents for your whatever, you know, Coke? Yes, I know, but the Lord is telling me water, you know? And the people at Taco Bell are like, uh-huh, come on through. So we get our order. We go back over to this guy. I feel brave now, so I roll my window down almost all the way. And I say, hi, here's your food, and here's your drink. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, what I left out is the boys are like, why are you getting water? And I'm like, Holy Spirit's telling me to get water. It's just what we're going to do. And so we get there, I roll down my window, here's your food, here's your drink. And he goes, oh, no, thank you. I have diabetes. So he couldn't have, you know, anything with sugar. So then I'm like, (laughs) you know, I start crying. He comforts me. (laughs) This was a really great ministry to the homeless day. Ma'am, don't cry for me. God's got me. He takes care of me. I said, I'm convicted. I just got saved all over again. Thank you so much. What's your story? Turns out he's been in a motorcycle accident, and they had put a steel plate in his head, and it caused him so much. It caused him to actually literally go crazy. And so he finds himself in Memphis, and he says, you got to take it out. Like, I don't care. You've got to take it out. Well, when they take it out, he loses all sense of like how to contact his family so no one knows where he is. Turns out we get him connected, our church, not us personally, gets him connected with his family and flies him home to St. Louis. So (laughs) thank you. That wasn't about the story except to say my kids saw that. My kids watched us obey the Holy Spirit and get water for this dude and hear his story. Instead of being afraid, my kids convinced me to do it. I wasn't even the spiritual one in that situation, okay? And so they saw that. These are the things that we remember so that when it's time for us and we're feeling like, does God even talk to me? Remember? Remember when you got water? You wanted to pay the, you didn't want to lose your 22 cents. That was me. That was me. And so that is the importance of remembering, but that is the importance of remembering for our children. That is the importance of doing life in such a way that they encounter the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, read the word to them. Yes, worship in your home. Yes, go to kids' ministry. Yes, go to youth. Yes, do the raffles. Yes, bake the cookies. Yes, do all of that. But more important than that, remember not just for them, but for you. The other piece to that is that when I lay in bed at night and I worry about their salvation, I worry about the choices that they're making. One's, you know, um, going to New York to do music. It's a little scary for me as his mom. So as I lay in bed at night and I pray through what the Lord has for him, I recount all the things he's done for them. Because I know that the word tells me that if I trained them up in the way that they should go, and I ushered them to the foot of Jesus, to the foot of the cross, that they will know him. And so I depend on that, and I prophesy that over them, and I prophesy it over our life. Is this resonating with anyone? Good. Good, because we're only on page two. No, I'll, I'll make it go faster. All right, so we also have Samuel. Lest we think Joshua is the only story, we already heard about Jacob. We also have Samuel. It says in 1 Samuel 7, verses 7 through 12. I'm going to summarize, okay? Basically, they're being attacked by the Philistines. And what happens is that it says, While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way. Skipping down, okay. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. So the Israelites, they're under this imminent attack. They're afraid, but God leads them to victory. Has he ever led you to victory in your life? Can you think of a time he's led you to victory? And how does Samuel respond? What does he do? He stops right there, and he remembers, and he prays, and he erects the stone. The stone of help is what Ebenezer means. The memorial stones made sure that all the glory was to God. Samuel didn't say, I defeated this army. 
He stopped, he prayed, he set up the stones because he wanted the people to remember God did this. All glory to God. That is the other thing that remembering does. It takes away our pride. I am so awesome. I fed this homeless guy, right? Seriously, how many times do we do that? We have our boxes and we check them off. You know, my religious boxes that tell me I'm doing a good job. Good job. And then that builds pride in me. I'm so obedient. I'm such a great daughter. Remembering wrecks that. Just when I think I'm good, I remember the goodness of God. And he says, no, ma'am, not about you. This is about me. This is about my glory. What about the story of the flood? How are we supposed to remember that God's not going to do it again? The rainbow. What about communion? What does the New Testament tell us we do when we take communion? We remember. We remember what Jesus did for us. We remember the sacrifice on the cross. We remember that his blood covers us. There's so much more in the word about remembering. I I encourage you, go do a word search yourself. It's over and over and over again. We see God creating these ways. We see him in the word showing us, let me show you how to do it because I know you're going to forget. I know you're going to get caught up in life and you're going to forget. And so I just want you to see how important this is. So... I read a blog post. I want to tell you one more story by this guy named Carl Brettel. And he talked about being in Jerusalem, and he visited this museum. And in the museum, there was a collection of these wooden rods, and they were from the shepherds. Isn't that a fun thought, you know, to think about those wooden rods still being there all these years later? But on the rods were all these marks. There were all these marks on them. And he said, what are these marks for? And they said every time the Lord showed up and protected the shepherds or the flock, they made a mark because they wanted to remember the goodness of God. In those moments where they were out alone and danger came, they wanted to immediately remember, oh, no, my God is bigger. My God is bigger than this. So when the impossible came, do you think they ran away? No. They were able to face it head on from this place of knowing who God was, of remembering and prophesying over the situation. If he did it once, he'll do it again. If he did it before, he'll do it again, right? All right, we're almost there. I want you to take a look at Psalm 77. The psalmist starts in a place of hopelessness, okay? This is what I love about the psalms. They're my favorite part of the word because they remind me that I'm, I'm no different than anyone else, that this is the human condition, It says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject me forever? You ever asked that? Are you going to keep rejecting me, God? Am I rejected? Will the Lord, will he ever show, I'm sorry, here we go. Will he never show his favor again? God, have I lost your favor? Did I do it too bad this time? Am I beyond your favor? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Do you still love me, God? Am I worthy of your love? Has his promise failed for all time? Do your promises remain true? Can I depend on those? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Mercy, Jesus, mercy. Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Have you ever had a situation where you felt that way? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, I I cannot make it apart from God? Absolutely you have because it's why you're sitting in this room. If you can't think of another situation, just think of your salvation. That salvation story we talked about at the beginning. You once were lost, but now you're found. Promises unfulfilled, hope deferred, broken relationships, sickness in your body, a broken heart, a wayward child. We see a pattern here. In the Psalms, they pour out their heart before the Lord. Have you poured out your heart before the Lord? 
to pour it out before him because something beautiful happens when we do that. Do you know what it does? It causes him to remind us. We pour it out before him and we're like, where are you? And he goes, remember? Remember? This is where I am. The psalmist leans in and decides to remember the deeds of the Lord. He meditates on God's miracles and mighty acts. Here's this next part. Are you ready? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works, and I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. What happens next is the most beautiful part in Scripture to me, and it's the most beautiful part in my life, in my walk, and in my journey with the Lord. This leads to an outpouring of praise and worship. When we remember the Lord, we cannot help but be grateful. We cannot help but worship him. We cannot help it. When we were worshiping earlier, I was so wrecked and overwhelmed, not because the singing was so great, although it was, okay? Not because you moved me with your cords, not because there was some false thing done, but because when we were worshiping and we were prophesying, we were speaking of God's promises, I was remembering that he did those things for me, that that's who he is. I was remembering that God is bigger, that his way is better, that I could lay those things down. I was remembering all this time I've had with him and his faithfulness and his goodness. And I was saying, yes, I remember, I remember, Lord. I remember who you are. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that I'm not God. Thank you that you're bigger. Your ways are better. Thank you that your promises are fulfilled. Thank you that when my hope feels dashed, you are a God of hope. Thank you that when I'm not carrying joy, you remind me that you are the carrier of joy and that your Holy Spirit in me releases joy. So when I have those doubts, when I feel, when I feel like I don't know God or I'm not hearing from God, have you said recently, I'm just not hearing from God? My friend, go remember. Go remember and your ears will become attuned and new because you'll remember how good he is. And all of a sudden you'll start to see it again. Proverbs tell us, for as a man thinketh, so is he. What our minds settle on is what we, are, we go in that direction. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So in our marriage, using that as an example, when I was like, he is getting on my nerves. Guess what he did? He got on them, every last one of them. But when I started remembering who he was, he loves traveling with me. He was like, thank you that I get to be your visual aid. But when I remembered who he was, it shifted. Was he a different person? Circumstances didn't change. But I remembered God, and I remembered who God was. I'm, and in this, I'm sorry, I remembered who Casey was. He's not God. He's pretty close, though. <laughs> so it burst this outpouring of worship and gratitude. Your ways, God, are holy. Would you say that? Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? What part of your life is as good as what you've received from the Father? What part of your life measures up to anything the Lord has done in your life? Right? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people. You are our Redeemer. The descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you, and they writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Do you think he was seeing God? When he came into this hopeless, do you even love me? Have you left me? And listen to the end of what he's saying. The arrows, the thunder, there was flashing back and forth. What was he doing? He was encountering the living God. And how did he get there? He remembered. He remembered, and God said, that's right. Now you remember who I am. Let me show you. Let me remind you again. Let me show you and show up today. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. 
Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. I'm going to say it again. By recalling what God has done for us, it prophesies right into the situation that we're in. If he'll do it once, he'll do it again. Our faith is restored when we remember. Our joy is uncovered when we remember. Our hearts turn from despair to praise. Does anybody need a little praise this morning? Does your heart need to turn from despair this morning? There's no doubt that I have laid a biblical precedent, right? I'm telling you there's 8 million more scriptures. Okay, that's an exaggeration. But there's a lot more scripture about remembering. And I shared with you these three cases of these biblical characters, and that's amazing. But what I really want to get to today is how about you? What about you? What do you need to remember today so that you can remember that he is holy? He is worthy He deserves us to remember who he is and for that to lead to an outpouring of gratitude and worship. And so I want to do that. I just want to make a space for that today. I didn't come here to be a theologian. I think I'm pretty smart most of the time, but then I get corrected. So usually not. But what I came here today to do was to align your hearts back to the Lord, was to say he is calling you to remember him. He wants intimacy with you. He wants to be the God who is remembered. It makes him happy. Isn't that a fun thought? It's like we're playing the birthday game. So let's play the birthday game with the Lord, okay? So what I would love, surprise, is someone from worship team, to just play something quietly in the background. And I would love for us to take a few moments to just remember the Lord, remember what he has done for us. I want to remind you as one last thing, you could be saying to me, I don't really have anything to think on right now, Charity. My life is this or that. You just don't know. And I would say to you, then remember the first thing. Just remember the first thing. He saved you. You're in this seat today. I'm assuming you're all believers, but maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> but you're here today because he plucked you up out of, out of the murk, out of the mire, and he said, you are mine. You are my beloved. So start there and see what it opens up. See what else you can remember and think on, okay? As it does, and it reignites your faith, And it reminds you of what he's done before. And it creates this atmosphere of worship. I want you to just cry it out. I'm not asking you to uh, perform. I'm actually asking you not to perform. I am asking you to take these next few moments and be with Jesus. Remember him and then release your sound to him. Release it to him. Tell him what you remember and what you're grateful for. Father, Your love overwhelms me. The way that you move wrecks me. The way that you desire our hearts, it just makes me want to fall on my face with gratitude. God, thank you for the things that you have done in our lives. May we remember them. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.